So if you don't have a recycling bin to source separate or separate at the point that the waste is made, don't, don't recycle because it's not going to work very well and it's going to be disgusting. It's going to be covered in food. I'll give you an example in a second. Um, but the same for your business. If you think, oh, just pull all the cans out after service you know, at the pub. No, you won't. You need to have a system where that waste is created that separates it there. That is the most effective place. It also will reduce contamination just by accident. And if you are the only person in your house and you know where your bins need to go and what needs to go, great. But if you have other people in your home, um, partners, kids, flatmates, tenants, whatever, who need to follow your system, then you need to sign it because people will put things in all the time thinking they're doing the right thing and it's just because they didn't know which bin it was. Uh, so make it really clear. <laughs> so uh, you hit the money on the head. We've, we've got a few areas of the home where we generally create bin, uh, waste and we generally need bins. You may only have one bin in your home and that works perfectly well for you. But if you have, are routinely creating a lot of waste in a certain area of your home, then maybe it's appropriate to look at a bin for that area. And it might be about finding the right bin for those types of items. So in the home office, you're generally going to have e-waste or paper waste. You're not generally going to have a lot of food waste or a lot of packaging waste unless you sit at your computer like me and eat all day. Um, so um, same for um, the laundry, you're generally going to have a bit of packaging waste maybe from your laundry powders and products, but beyond that, um, you know, it's going to be the dryer lint or the, um, you know, something gross that came out of the washing. You know, so um, think about what waste is created and therefore what bin is really required. And you can source separate, i.e. you can have two or three bins in every room. Bins don't have to be very large if you're not creating a lot of waste in that area. So if your laundry waste is a mixture of recyclables and non-recyclables, you could easily have two small bins that would work there. Or you can decide that when you create recyclables in that area, then you take them to the kitchen or to the pantry. So it's about making decisions that work for you, but what I would say is make sure that the bins are set up so that you are set up to get it right. Because when we get to the bin, um, it should be the final step. It shouldn't be the place we're making all the decisions because that's when we start to just go, oh, I can't fit it, I don't know, I'll just put it all in here. Um, so if, if you can set it up, um, yeah, get it right from the start. And I've just lost my slides. So I would generally say that in the garage and the shed, you're not going to be creating a huge amount of curbside recyclables that are appropriate. You might get a little bit of cardboard boxes, you may get the occasional container, but the sort of waste that we create in those areas of the house, the house or the, the garden are generally not suitable as a guide. Um, and we'll talk about the recycling rules in a second that, that articulate that. But just be aware that if you think that, you know, if you only put your yellow bean in the shed, and that's your only choice, you're just asking for contamination. So whatever bean you put in a certain area, you're just signalling to whoever uses it, you, you know, the person who does your maintenance or the gardening, oh yeah, you can put your green bean there because it's the only bean I can, the only your green waste in here, it's the only waste I can see. So just think about the signal you're sending uh, because you generally won't, um, yeah, not every bin is appropriate for every place in the house. So if you are going to set up your bins, there's lots of different ways you can do it. Um, I've stolen these from a few people that uh, were kind enough to volunteer their a photo of inside their house and their bin room. Um, so you can go to whatever extent you like. If you want to label them and colour code them, by all means. Um, if you want to set up a little micro recycling facility with additional items like bread tags and lids and batteries and all those other items, great, set them up. Um, but make sure you sign what they are and what you're meant to be doing with it, otherwise you're just wasting your time. And if you're going to store it, make sure, as I said, it's stored appropriately for the item that's in, the, in that area of the house. So under kitchen, great, pantries are great, 
you really are going to create the bulk of your recyclables in the kitchen. Um, you need to make sure that you can rinse or at least clean items enough that they aren't incredibly contaminated. So that generally means you're going to need a sink. And that makes sense to me that if you're going to wash and clean that item, that it's then going to go fairly close to the sink after you've maybe dried it or drained it. So the kitchen is a great area. It's also an area we don't have a lot of room. So some people put it somewhere slightly, uh, you know, in the garage or slightly room to the side of the house. But the kitchen is where the bulk of your recyclables will be coming from. Um, that also means setting up other systems. If you know you don't like throwing certain things out, then have a system for that item that enables you to collect it until such time you can take it to an appropriate place. If you know that you're going to want to take secondhand clothes to somewhere, make sure you have a system so it doesn't just sit at the bottom of the cupboard or you know, uh, in the garage and then your partner gets upset and then have a system. It's going to be there, you're going to create it. Same for e-waste, make sure you have a basket so that you can collect it all so someone doesn't accidentally put it into the red bin when you wanted to take it for recycling. Um, make sure that you have a system for things like batteries. Now you know how dangerous they are, they need to be kept separate and you need to be able to keep them and make sure that someone just doesn't empty them. And not, if you ever have a cleaning lady or someone who ever, you know, comes into your home and empties your bin, make sure that they know that that's not to go um, into the main bin. Now, this always comes up with recycling. Everyone wants to know about the numbers. Tell me about the numbers. Which number do I use? What number goes in which bin? And the little triangle, if it's got a little triangle, I can put it in any bin, right? I can put it all in the... I just want to say everyone needs to stop worrying about the numbers. Who knows why we have those triangles and numbers on the packaging that we have? Is it for us? It is not for us. Forget the numbers is what I would say to you. Forget the numbers, be liberated from the numbers. We need to think about form, function, what it's made out of. And if you want to look at any label, then have a look at the Australasian recycling label. The ARL label, you'll see it all and more and more. The black label from Planet Ark, it's on most products from most major supermarkets now. That is the source of truth. The triangle will tell you the type of plastic it is, it will not tell you whether it's curbside recycling. If your council has gone to the level of saying, you can put you know, two in here and you can put, great. But I can tell you right now, not everything has a little triangle on it. And even if it does, it will get very confusing very quickly because not everything is the same thickness, not everything holds the same shape, not everything works in the same way. So if you're going to use a label, use the Australasian recycling label, which is the black one from Planet Ark. And don't look at symbols that just have the recycling symbol on it and trust that that means that the person who created that product, wherever they are, knows what Tamworth Regional Council's waste streams take. They have no idea. They, are, they have no concept. They may not even know that their product is in Australia. <laughs> So do not trust that the person who made that product knows what you're going to do with it and that they have any confidence. They don't. Um, so don't fall for the labels. And there's actually very little um, constraints about use what we can use. You can put that label on anything. I could say I'm recyclable. I might be. I guess I go, eventually I am. But it doesn't mean that I'm curbside recyclable. So now I'm going to take some questions in a second, but I want to give you my recycling rules and my three little tips or tests that will hopefully give you some confidence. Now I've said forget the numbers. This is what I want you to remember. So the five recycling rules that will help you are these. Now you need not one, you need all five. <laughs> Firstly is that recycling in the yellow bin is for containers and packaging from the kitchen, the laundry and the bathroom. Very rarely is it much else. It's not the paint cans from the garage, it's not the additional packaging that's come from some stereo that you bought generally. It might, but as a rule, 
This is set up for the sorts of things that you'll find in the kitchen, the laundry, and the bathroom. And it doesn't mean that it'll take all three of those on every item either. And the other rules will help you decide that. But keep it simple. Know that you can um, recycle hard plastic containers, glass bottles and jars, steel cans, aluminium drink cans, paper, cardboard, tetra packs. All from the kitchen, bathroom and laundry. The second rule for our recycling rules is that it needs to be loose, empty and rinsed clean. It should not be full, it should not be filthy and it shouldn't be bagged in plastic. What happens to bagged recyclables, do you think? You think about that system, it's just come off the back of the truck, it's gone to the conveyor belt, picked and chucked immediately. Why? They do not have time. Think they've got time to pull apart your bag and go, oh, well done, they've rinsed all their recycle. No. Out. For all they know, it's full of syringes and they ain't going to waste their time. So please do not, you might want to keep your bin clean, that's fine. If you want to put a bag over it, fine, but make sure it doesn't bag up what's inside. It, it is deliberately meant to be loose. It is deliberately meant to be um, uncompacted. We don't want you to jam things down to the bottom of the recycling bin so that it's flat. Because you just saw that we're using things like scanners and, and human hands to pick up items. We want them to still stay in somewhat of their shape. So um, loose, clean, empty. Um, and when I say rinsed clean, it doesn't have to be so clean that you would eat out of it. It doesn't have to be pristine or sanitised. But if it has visible chunks of food on it, remove the visible chunks of food. So if it has um, a Nutella jar, for example, make sure you get that Nutella out. Put some hot water in there and make hot chocolate. Or if it's got Vegemite, you know, put some water in there and make stock. Uh, but just get the chunks out because that adds as a contaminant. Um, other things that can contaminate are really soiled. Um, so paper that's really soiled with oil or grease. Um, so you'll often hear people talk about pizza boxes, that it can be a problem. If it is so contaminated that it's, it's kind of gross, um, then it's probably fair that it should either go in your compost or into the red bin. But um, because at the end of the day, your recycling bin shouldn't smell. It shouldn't be a stinky bin. I always say to the kids, there's a stinky bin and a non-stinky bin. It might smell a bit like wine or beer at the end of the week, but it shouldn't smell like too much else. It certainly shouldn't smell like milk curds or anything gross. Um, so just make sure that the big chunks of, of contaminants are removed and that will help us all reduce contamination at the other end. They need to be whole as much as possible. Can anyone think of something that we often put in recycling bins that isn't whole that causes an awful lot of problems? Glasses, are, glasses is an interesting one because when you put a bottle in there and you clunk it and you hear it break, yeah. So glass is one of those ones that, look, it's going to break in the truck a little bit. Anything else? Something that comes from secure offices. Does anyone still shred paper? Yeah. So if you have a shred paper, it's paper, right? It should be recyclable. But what happens when we put it on a conveyor belt and there's a fan that blows that? It's like Christmas. <laughs> So we don't want to put shredded paper or anything that is really small in there. Now that goes for um, one of our rules in a second. If it is too small, it will not be recycled. Again, because our systems just do not cope and the scale of which they need to collect means that anything very small is going to cause problems. So, um, so it needs to be as whole as possible. Now that again means you know, if your kids cut up 100 pieces of tiny little bits of paper and then you put that in your recycling bin, all it's going to do is act as a contaminant now. It's going to get into the aluminium can, it's going to stick to the side of the glass bottle. So you're just actually creating some more issues. So it needs to stay, um, obviously you can, you can separate it and, and if it's cardboard, make it smaller, but try not to cut it into pieces in some view that it will help the process. <laughs> because um, a lot of the equipment responds to the shape, as I said, again, 
all the weight um, or the way that um, you know it behaves. All right, we've already heard me talk about this. That image there is not something I want you to do. Um, so it needs to be safe. And safe means a few different things. It means that it won't blow up and create a fire. <laughs> so it, it shouldn't be um, you know, a battery. It shouldn't be something that has a, a charge. Um, it shouldn't uh, be something that could hurt someone at the other end. Um, obviously, they are expecting sharp glass, but it shouldn't be sharps. Um, it shouldn't be um, strapping lines or hoses or nettings or wire or bed sheets or clothing or building materials, which are all things that have been found in recycling. Uh, it shouldn't be dead. There's no organic dead things, please. Um, and we see it happen. And why do you think people put these things in there? Do you think they put them in there because they actually think it's going to be recycled? No. Often people put things in here as an overflow from there. And you often have people complaining that they're a very good recycler, but their neighbours are very bad recyclers and they put things in their bin because their bin's very empty. And on bin day, other people come and put stuff in. Um, and that is, a, that is a serious issue that causes some pretty big neighbourhood wars. So, um, but yes, please don't put dead things in your yellow bin. It's funny that we even have to say that, right? Um, nothing stinky, no nappies, um, nothing, again, that's infectious. Um, you know, we had that story before was a lot about the risk that um, people who worked in waste suffered through COVID. They're on the front line pretty much of contaminants. They're dealing with people that stuff people put in their mouth. And um, during the pandemic, they couldn't stop working. Um, so you've got to think about the risks that we put other human beings through. Um, and if shouldn't be anything uh, medical of any kind, um, shouldn't be sharps or any kind of medical waste. Um, I actually know it's pretty horrific. Maybe I don't want to record this, but um, there was um, I, I've become aware that there was a community that was complaining that there was a cosmetic um, clinic near their home, and they were aware that there were bundles of human fat being put in their recycling bin. So um, you can imagine if we're disgusted by just the thought of that, what the poor people at the waste facility um, were concerned about when they opened that bin. And there are fines for that sort of behaviour. That's, that is definitely worth reporting to the EPA. Um, as I mentioned, if you are standing there at the bin and you are just like, I don't know, I, it could be, it might not be, please leave it out. It is better for it to go in the red bin and you find out than to guess and make it a contaminant. So if you were that worried about something and if you were then upset when you found out that it's not recyclable, then that's up to you to try and find a better solution. I know people that start to change their behaviours once they realise, oh, I'm not buying that anymore, I didn't realise it's not recyclable. Um, so it is better to avoid it going in the bin at all um, than putting it in and hoping for the best. All right, here's some tips. First and foremost, for plastic, if you can scrunch it and it bounces back and keeps its shape, then it is probably going to be more appropriate than not to go in your yellow bin. And I'll show you an example in a second. Um, but we're talking about hard plastic containers like bottles or um, takeaway containers or some of the packaging that we see um, come through um, in biscuits or yogurts. If, it, if you try to give it a scrunch and it sort of bounces back, it's probably going to be the right sort of thing for your bin. If you scrunch it and it goes into a ball, like a plastic bag, it is not appropriate. Now, I will say that some councils are trialling a soft plastics um, program, and if that is your council, then you will have a very specific uh, mandate, which will generally be put the soft plastics in another bag and then put it in. Uh, we don't want loose soft plastics in your bin. Does anyone know why? 
Yeah, it causes a huge amount of issues at the other end. Again, you think about all the moving parts of those facilities um, and the fact that soft plastics are very, very good at getting into other things. Um, so it can get trapped in the materials and cause um, in some major metropolitan facilities up to two hours downtime a day just literally unwrapping plastic from the machine machinery. So um, again, we pay for that. They would factor that into their contracts for councils. They say, well, we have two hours a day, we don't process the stuff, but we'll just make sure that that's covered in the costs in our contract. So we pay for it. Um, but yeah, it's a huge issue. And it means that literally a human has to go and unwrap that stuff with a big hook, but still, it's pretty ghastly stuff. Um, so, if you're going to scrunch it, um, yeah, that's one way of determining whether it's the appropriate sort of plastic. Um, a lot of people get worried about the sort of paper that goes in their recycling bins because a lot of the, the paper we get these days is bonded with, with plastic. You only need to put certain um, packaging in your compost, if you ever have a compost heap, to drag it out later and realise it's coated in plastic. Um, business cards are a perfect example. A lot of those are actually coated with plastic. Same as coffee cups, they're a paper bonded to plastic. So um, when you put those items in a yellow bin, um, the equipment isn't there to separate plastic from paper. It's there to take paper and plastic. And they, the process to separate items like that, and the exception is the Tetra Pak, um, but generally the process is that it requires a completely different system. So if you believe something is coated in plastic, don't put it in. Now, people go, well, how will I know that? Because it all looks the same. The only way I know how to do that is to tear the paper. So if you see some packaging, and I'll show you this, and it looks kind of shiny, and it could be, if you can tear it and you can see the grains of the paper in it, we're okay. I've got one over here. If I try and tear this, and I did, I can see there's quite a lot of plastic underneath there. Now, if you're really enthusiastic, and I don't know anyone who is, you can actually rip the plastic off and put the cardboard in and the plastic in your red bin. Um, but it is really tricky, and this is the complexity of what citizens have to deal with because we've got people producing products that look like cardboard that are actually not great. Now, when councils are looking at contamination, is this their biggest issue? No, it is not. And to be honest, they factor a little bit of this in anyway. But if you want to be a really, really good recycler, um, thinking about whether it's actually paper the whole way through or if it's got some other issue going on um, is useful. And I think it's useful for us to understand as well that things that we think are reasonably okay for the environment actually may not be as okay. <laughs> Um, so um, just having a look. But yeah, that's a little extra level of involvement if you're wanting to tear an item to work out whether it is actually paper or not. Um, if it's smaller than your fist, it will also be unlikely to get recycled. So that means business cards, generally, if you put them in your recycling bin, um, may not be making it to where it needs to go. Um, that means lids. If you're just dumping a whole bunch of lids in there, it's unlikely that it's going to be recycled. Um, some of them, in some of the processes, get there, but generally small and loose is just going to be sort of either fall through the systems and get swept up or um, end up as sort of excess um, at the end of the line. So there are other solutions for those. Now, none of them are amazing and none of them are completely easy for residents, but um, generally if it's small, it, it, it's just not going to make it through. All right. Now we'll go through some things that you should not be putting in the yellow bin. And there's going to be a little quiz in a second with these items. Um, please don't put organic waste of any kind in the yellow bin. Please don't put single-use plastics like forks, plastic plates, plastic cups, coffee cups in the yellow bin. Please don't put polystyrene in your yellow bin, even though it has the symbol and it taunts us because it says it's recyclable. Um, and please don't put bagged waste 
in your recycling bin because we talked about the fact that it just won't make it. Textiles should never go in your bin. They're actually a huge contaminant and textiles are, by definition, an organic waste. They behave in a similar way to food once they're in, in landfill, but they also, so they, you know, we should keep them out of the red bin as well, but um, they really should, um, they, yeah, they, they just tangle up the material, uh, the machinery as well, so they behave a bit like plastic bags. Um, and please don't put things like mulch or green waste in there. Um, again, completely inappropriate, but also a huge contaminant that gets wrapped up in everything. Now here's some of the things you definitely should not be putting in your yellow bin, um, which we've already talked about, but Karen can tell you this is things that have been found in our waste streams, in our recycling streams. Oils and petrols, cooking oils, e-waste. We know e-waste is both incredibly um, valuable because it's filled with rare earth metals that we should be recycling and using, but cannot be collected through our yellow bin. Um, and also has other chemicals that we don't want to leach out as well through batteries. Um, do not put sharps in or medical waste. Keep your building materials out of there. Again, not the place for it. And definitely do not put your dead turtle in the yellow bin. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna cover a couple of things before we go into um, where these items go. Um, so first of all, most people are probably familiar with this now. It once was a pretty niche um, thing to do, but most people know that you can take your soft plastics if you don't have a soft plastic service back to most um, Coles, Woolies, um, IGA. Um, you can you can drop them back into a facility which is managed by Redcycle or another plastics recycling facility. Is it the best solution in the world? No, but it's we've got it and we everything's wrapped in plastic. So for now, it's what we've got. Um, please make sure it's clean. The biggest issue they have is mould and, um, and contamination because of residue in there. So make sure it's clean and dry, anything you drop back there. You can actually go and have a look at what sites are near you if you're not sure your local facility. If you uh, have medical sharps, um, then you may have a community sharps disposal near you. Um, you also can take uh, your own sharps disposal unit back to chemists um, on the most part, um, but please never put loose sharps in any bin. They do not belong in there. There's, um, I think, uh, quite a number. This is one in Tamworth. There's quite a number of sharps disposal units. There's no reason why we need to put them into any of our residential bins. Um, we also have Amazing Facility funded by the EPA, which is your community recycling centres. Uh, and which there in your region is 11. Um, and so 10 of your 12 council areas have these um, and they will take a whole bunch of items which you may be tempted to put in the yellow bin, but you won't now. They will take paint and smoke detectors and household batteries and gas bottles and fire extinguishers and light globes and fluoro globes and um, car batteries and excess oil. Um, some may even take mobile phones, uh, printer cartridges, um, additional e-waste. Some will take old glasses um, and x-rays as well. And we also have um, these great little pop-up community drop-off stations. So um, you can dro generally drop off light bulbs, batteries and smoke detectors to these. Um, and you have those in your community as well. Um, and there's a list of the sites on the website, I believe. Um, so you can check out through your local council or through Northern Inland Regional Waste to find out where your local centre is. You don't need to go to this every day. This is like a once every six month kind of activity. Um, so if you have the right system set up in your garage or your shed, you can store up some of these items and maybe go and do it, you know, when you go to the library next or, or that sort of trip into town. Uh, you also probably have a return and earn facility or a, um, a reverse vending machine in town. Um, and you might think, well, what's the point of doing that when I could put it in here? Um, it, you can do either, but the point is that it can go back into your pocket. Um, you've paid the extra 10 cents. Um, it is 
a deposit that you've put on that item, so you may as well get it back. Um, anyone who thinks that that deposit has just been magically given back to you, you pay for that in your price of your soft drink or beer. Um, so yeah, if you get that back, that's um, yeah, it's a great way to help you, but also the facility that takes the bottles and, um, and cans from the fruit recycle, but the RVNs return it is a um, is a much cleaner stream. It's not going to the same facilities. It's going to bottle only facilities generally. So um, contamination is even lower, and the prices on that kind of commodity is even higher. So it's a good, uh, you know, maybe not the best for council always, but um, it's a great scheme that's really helped um, our communities and a lot of fundraising as well. Um, if you have an office works close by, you can also use them for recycling and drop off. And if you have, um, if you ever want to drop your mobile phones back to Mobile Master, that's a service that also exists if you don't want to drop it off elsewhere. So, I'm going to run through a couple of items, and I want you to tell me, based on our rules, whether you think it goes in the yellow or the red bin or somewhere else. All right, you're feeling good? I'm going to bring our bins together. If you haven't been watching, you've had a few clues, because I've had them on this, each side. I'm going to go rogue and separate them. All right. It's not empty. First of all, if it was empty, where would I put it? it if it's empty. If it's empty. Yeah, sorry, sorry. If it's full, use it up. <laughs> yeah, so you can drop it to the CRC. Yep. Do we ever put these in here, Karen? No. So if it's still got a chemical paint, something else in there, we're going to assume it's, it's empty. We can pop it in there. Awesome. Great. These bad boys? Yes. Is that a plastic lid on the... It is. Yeah, look. So do you take the lid off? Yeah, in, in an ideal world, take the lid off. Is it going to break the system if you have a little bit of... And lids are generally considered a contaminant that they will cope with. They have a percentage of contaminants, yes. Lids in, but lids off. I like this. This is this is deep. It's quite philosophical. Does that mean lids off the containers, but you can just chuck them in? Yes. Beautiful. I love that. That's even simpler than what we have. No, lids off. Lids off, and not in. There you go. Who's confused? <laughs> All right. So, and that's why it's so important that we go back to our council. Obviously, there's a lid. Um, so, some councils don't want them on. Ours want lids on. And in. So, you know, it's just. Lids off, lids in. Tamworth, because we're here. There you go. So, just a question about that. Does that mean that the lids just come off the conveyor and then it's just. Like, they're just done that to simplify. Not because they're going to recycle the lids. Look, it depends on the contractor. Some of them may. I know some that do, but it's such a. You think about it's different types of plastic, a thousand different colours. Not the easiest thing. Um, yeah. Mm. Who knows what happens to a, a bottle that still has liquid in it? Yeah, I know they gave it to me on the plane before I could say no. Um, but I'm like, oh, I'll use it in my. So what happens to something like this? Yeah, so it, it, first of all, it will burst. Um, so, um, yeah, so if it goes in there, what also is different about this than if it was empty? It's much heavier. So what do we see happens with plastic bottles? They often get pushed off with air. If it's full, it's not moving. So it's going to probably cause issues. It will also <laughs> break and squirt everywhere. Um, you know, so yeah, please don't put it full in that. If that was... Drunk, then it could go in there. <laughs> we'll drink it first. All right, so what have we decided about these guys? Absolutely. And, and uh, these ones? Everyone's like, but it's got a symbol. 
it's got a symbol, it is so lightweight, it ain't going to make it. I, there's, it's small. It, if it had a party and you put ten of them together or something. <laughs> Look, and this is where we start to get this bargaining, I love it. It's like, yeah, but, but what if I stacked all my strawberry containers together? And then, look, okay. and it's a risk. But what's our rule? Yeah. Beautiful. All right, we talked about this, it's got plastic on it. If it was in my house, which it is in my house, um, I would probably rip the plastic off because I'm a loser um, and put it in there. Um, but, but then if you rip the plastic off with little bits of your darn use, it's a bit of going to green and compost. I'd actually, I actually end up composting, yeah. So if you've got a compost, cardboard that ripped up, or worm farms, best thing ever. Um, so yeah, we, we might decide. But if you, if you, again, if you're really worried and it feels to you like it is, sometimes it has double plastic. Um, those paste, uh, cake boxes from your bakery, perfect example of, um, they'll often, because they're waterproof, or it might be wax as well. So if it doesn't feel like paper, then chuck it. Yeah, so red or plastic recycling. Yep. I'll just say red now because we don't have our... Now here's something which arguably is recyclable but has some food in it. It has to be washed first. Yeah, so we'd get rid of that. I won't empty that in there because Karen's cleaned the bins. But yeah, please empty it out. Um, what about this top part and the back bottom bit? It's a good one for your scrunch test. Probably fair chance the bottom bit is recyclable. Top bit, not so much. Yeah, soft plastics, 100%. Yep. And again, just make sure it's clean. I'm going to put that over there. I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, cans. Yep. Now, people get upset because they're like, but it's plastic inside. Yeah, there is plastic inside these cans, but it's all right. The, the company that deals with them are okay to take that. All right. Tin lid on that one, okay. I mean, shoving the tin, but yeah, I think I've got them in there. Yeah, please don't put them in there unless you've got a very specific mandate from your council that they're taking them. A lot of soft plastics recyclers um, may take them, so you can check with Red Cycle if they're doing it, or it's a TerraCycle. I don't know if anyone's done TerraCycle, but it's it's like custom recycling for very hard to recycle items. So for now. Everyone's getting very upset because they're like, there's so many things. What about wet wipes? They look papery. No, Absolutely not. <laughs> um, coffee pots. The couple of rules these guys break. I, I scoop the centre out of them and, yep. and put that in the compost. Beautiful. And put the aluminium into, well, it's probably too small, into the, that one there. Yep, so if it's aluminium, which it is, and what do we know about aluminium? You probably don't know much, but we know aluminium is, if we can get it back, infinitely recyclable. It's great. It's a metal, very light, able to, and we can also do a great job of folding it down. The thing about that is making sure it's not too small. So if we emptied it and then put it straight in there, not so much. But you could, if you really wanted to, clean it out, um, and then if it's aluminium, and you'll know it's aluminium because it responds with light and it's really flexible, you can roll it up. Your kids can collect all their Easter egg foil and wrap it up in a big ball and then they can put it in there. Make it believe it has to be a certain size before it Sorry? It has to be a certain size before it gets recycled. Yeah, so make sure it's a big ball, and, if, and make sure it's a big ball that's somewhat crushed because if it's just, oh, it's big, but you know, as soon as it gets in that truck, it's, <laughs> it's going to be squashed. All right, what do we got else in here? Crockery. <laughs> yes, please don't put them. I'll leave that there. Excellent. We've got our plastics here. Why? It's not a package. Yeah. So what's the difference between these two? It's not the Best, I, by best example, but what's the difference between a jar and a drinking glass? Does anyone know? The amount of silica. Yeah, so, so it behaves differently at temperature. So some of them will be very recyclable and will be, make gra like great glass finds, say that. Um, and these ones, not so much. So if you break a wine glass, put it in your red bin. <laughs> um, it's the reason that, you know how some jars, um, 
Some glass will hold up to heat if you put hot water in it and some won't. If you ever put hot water, boiling hot water into a wine glass, for example, you know, not a good idea. Um, all right, these are getting a bit easier now. Yeah. Beautiful. Or? CDS. Yes. Great. Now, the label on that, any, any reason why we... The, the label on it, is that a Yeah, so you can take the label off. Um, I tend to send them to return it and they don't care. You actually need to leave the label on. Um, but if you are, yes, if you're going to be a great recycler, again, is it going to be the level of contamination that we're really worried about? Probably not. Let's remember we're dealing with dead, dead marlin and boa constrictors. That's the kind of level of contamination we need to... Um, I'm leaving it on, but in. I don't know what I'm doing in Tamworth. Um, I'm going to take it off for you in Gunda, and I'm going to put it, take it off and put it in. Oh, I'm so confused now. It's a different kind of plastic to the bottle. It is a different type of plastic. So does that make it easier for my processor to have those separated? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah but I just don't think that at that scale they're going to be... Because, again, there's so many different types of plastic in the lids. Some... Yeah, it's one, it's one of those spaces that I think we will see further action on. I've already heard noises about it, but yeah, at the moment... Yeah, and the colours, for example. It's lovely that we have so many colours, but you know the bane of existence... A bane of the existence of recyclers is colour. So who thinks those... Um, there's a whole kind of... Um, brown plastic it's kind of been associated with organic hand soap and um, it's like an Aesop bottle but it's plastic so you'll see a lot of that it's a terrible colour plastic for recyclers because you'll notice this is 100% recycled plastic um, and you'll see the colour is slightly greyer and darker than um, you'll see it in the this is 100% recycled plastic as well. Um, the colour's slightly different and it just causes grief. So that's why, um, yeah, clear plastic's actually better for in and on and off and in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a couple more. Yeah, red. What else can you do with rags? Green. <laughs> um, if it's cotton, you can put it in your compost, yeah. Um, if, um, if it's still something that's very usable, then obviously please donate it, but please don't donate something just because you don't want to put it in your red bin. That's a very bad idea. Karen, she's giving me the yeah. Um, my, the word on the street is this level of contamination, they're okay with. If you really want to feel like you'd like to take the window off, sure. But again, there's a little window, literally a little window, um, that you can go with. Is right. paper too small or not? No, that one's okay. Yeah. Business card, too small. Shredder paper, too small. I've been in the habit of ripping them in half, now that's not helpful, is it? Um, look, I would, yeah, why do you rip them in half? Because that's finished with. <laughs> <laughs> I've opened that bill, yeah. <laughs> the one with the windows definitely needs to be ripped in half. No, um, yeah, you don't need to. Again, and if, if you're scrunching paper up into little balls, it's probably better to just put them in. Yeah. We're okay with this? Yeah. That's what my 95% of mine is. No. <laughs> um, all right. Then we got this Tetra pack. <laughs> I won't open it, but a good example of why we'd open it and take the lid off. Um, yeah. So, um... They can, it, poppers can go to the CDS, so, um, to return it. Um, most councils will accept Tetra packs. They aren't the greatest thing to recycle. What are they made up of other than just paper? And, yeah, so I've got the three. Just bond those plastic on the outside, paper in the middle, and aluminium or, um, and plastic in the inside. Um, so, yeah, but lid off, in, off, in, on. <laughs> Um, I don't, no. It's going to get a bit flat anyway, but if your idea of, if you are someone who likes to flatten their milk bottles, I wouldn't be. 
Excellent, I love it. It's show and tell. Oh, excellent, great. Coffee back. No one knows. Do first of all, no, definitely not. Yeah, definitely not in there. Um, even yeah, really good. Um, it's even not accepted by some bread cycle. Um, again, I think it's because it's a mixture of metal and plastic. Um, there are specialist coffee bag recyclers. I think um, I'm actually. It, again, if you're only getting one every couple of weeks, it's uh, what I actually do with them is use them to line my bin to put other rubbish in. So yeah, um, I would check with Red Cycle, but my gut feel is it's probably not. Yeah, it's hard, isn't it? Because all of a sudden you go, oh, I don't really. Want. All right, last couple. These ones upset people. Yeah. It is okay. It's it's on the it's on the borderline because it's one of those things that you know you've seen them driven over in a car in a car park. Like it, they go flat. They're very lightweight. They behave a bit like almost a single use a single use plastic. But um, these will be gradually phased out. I'm pretty confident. You're already starting to see cardboard cut back in for tomatoes and uh, strawberries. Yeah. So it is. Um, Let's have a look. Yep, it is. It's a PET, but so it, it's going to make it to the same. It's just whether it makes it. It might fly off with the paper, for example. It's a bit small. So, yeah, again, this is where that avoidance starts coming in. It's very hard, but if you can try and avoid some of those problematic. Last ones. Second ones. Yep. Beautiful. If you've read them. I haven't actually. <laughs> Alright, and then this one's problematic for people. You see a lot of this. So it's all very nice to say, oh, it's just this. But when you open something and inside it's got things like this, we start to have a mild panic attack. So we're confident with the cardboard. And then we've got this thing. Yeah, we definitely could send that to a um, red cycle. So then we're left with this bad boy. Again, so some of us would just go, well, I don't know, so I'm just going to put it in there. And I I would, in my home, I would put it in here. Karen's nodding. <laughs> um, obviously, again, it's one of those items that if you can avoid this level of packaging, it's literally biscuits, cheese, and, you know, like, we could make our own home, but we understand we live in a very convenient But, yes, it's probably, it's a bit like a strawberry punnet. It's going to be on the... Um, Excellent. I won't throw that in the bin. And then these guys, hopefully you got the message on these ones now. Yeah. So don't put them in any of the bins. Take it to your um, community drop-off or your CRC. Are there any options for pens and bio Because I found that they are yeah. um, they I've got a shoebox. Yep. Yeah. So any options for pens and biros? Um, yep, yeah, we've got... Yeah, I check if you, you've got an office works in your town. Yeah, check with them because they're at the centre of their stores. They have a number. Um, that's the only um, office works I've seen do it, and I've seen TerraCycle set up at schools particularly because again, it's about volume, right? And this is the problem with these things. We get a little bit, but we need volume, so we need everyone's. <laughs> so um, again, it's the right thing to do if you're really wanting to collect them. Um, is to start to build up a, a bundle of them so that you've actually got you know, more than one. Um, yeah, so. It might be something for our lines because Lee talking about setting up um, battery points so there's more points for people and batteries that maybe pens could be added to that. Yeah, so you, I guess what, what I'd say for, if for fundraising, yeah, for fundraising opportunities or um, to provide a service, it's all about scale and convenience. So how can you set it up? Um, and I'll just say a quick couple of notes before we finish up. Um, and obviously, if you've got burning questions, please throw those in. But if you're going to do anything, just recognise that most people are really passionate about this, but there are people who are less 
um, likely to participate. It doesn't mean that they're horrible people. <laughs> Um, but just know that um, whenever we do anything, and if it's changing someone's habits, i.e. we're talking to staff or community or our partners about um, doing something different, that the people respond at different times and in their own way. So, um, as, as we said, Australians are very passionate about this. We don't do it amazingly, um, but we're, um, we are committed. So if you provide a solution which will meet a need then, and it's convenient, People will want to use it, but if convenience is the factor. You know, are they going to go to the CRC and drop it off, or is it just, I'll just put it in, no one needs to know. You know, so that's the problem we face, because people really want convenience. Um, think about where you are. If you're trying to change someone's habit, where are they that they need that prompt? You know, that you need to provide them a cue at the point that that behaviour actually needs to change. Um, and that, you know, when we're changing a behaviour, that's always about routine, and so trying to get people in a school, for example, to do something differently. You're going to have to reinforce it over and over and over again until it becomes habit. And even then, um, you know, we get it wrong and it happens. Um, so feedback is important as well. Um, I just had a bit for kids. Um, there's lots of ways you can make recycling fun. In fact, kids are really good at this. They really get taught a lot of it at daycare um, and early childhood education. Um, so we don't have to worry so much about getting them engaged, but there are lots of ways. Um, teenagers, on the other hand, hit me up with your ideas because um, I work with secondary schools. And beyond putting a basketball hoop on the bin, um, I got to the point where I was like, I'm not really sure what else to do with you guys. Um, but that's the end of the, the sort of my bit. I've talked a lot, um, but I'm hoping that if you've got questions that have remained unanswered, that you can throw those up now. I've got the microphone so I can throw to you. Um, but um, I guess what I would say to you is that it can feel incredibly overwhelming. Um, it will only be the small things that are really worrying us though, hopefully. Like it'll be the coffee bag and the pens and the blister packs and the broken wine glass. And yes, they're upsetting, but when you think about the scale of the other stuff that we need to get right, that's where we should be focusing our energy. So it's about being smart, um, obviously avoiding as much waste as possible, but keeping those five rules and those three tips in mind and try not to get too hung up on, oh, but it should be this, and it, because, to be honest, there's bigger fish to fry. <laughs> Don't put fish in it. Um, <laughs> Did anyone have any guesses? Much a question, but I mean, we tried. Um, it, it must be nearly 30 years ago to get recycling going at Manila, and what seems to have happened is that the business is telling us, you know, they're selling us their stuff, and then we gotta get confused and decide where it goes. Is there some way we can get businesses? I guess it's a, it's probably a legislation where you're not allowed to manufacture that or that the government gives the businesses incentives not to produce yep. in so the first place. Yeah, so the question's about what can we do to incentivize or de decentivize? de incentivize dis Disincentivize. Yeah. <laughs> discourage. <laughs> discourage. Uh, yeah, what can yeah. you do to discourage businesses from doing the wrong thing? So, um, so or making it easier for us. Yeah. Oh, yes, thank you. I love that. That, was, yeah, that would have been a dramatic finish, wouldn't it? Um, so there are a couple of things you can look at. One is the Australian packaging targets. So there are actual um, binding requirements that businesses have to apply, um, comply with. We're not doing amazingly when you look at the way businesses are, um, you know, in Australia sort of as a nation. But you'll see brands and bit like Nestle starting to do things like put paper back into their packaging for their Smarties and Coca-Cola putting 100% recycled plastic back into it. Yes, it's still a plastic bottle, but it is better than what they were doing before. Um, there's APCO, which is the Australian Packaging Covenant Organisation, which is a optional organisation that large businesses can be part of. Um, that make a commitment about um, where they, what kind of packaging they provide. And then there are stewardship schemes which are often requiring government intervention, but you see things like batteries, and that's where um, you know, there will be 
uh, funding and incentives for, for and, and also a requirement of people who produce certain things to take them back. So there's yeah, there's heaps that can be done. Is there a particular business that you can that you've got in mind when you're saying this? Is it one thing or one, or is it just the scope? Uh, I, I, of, think, I think it's, a, it's an attitude that you know um, people aren't seeing the whole cycle, and if you know we're getting sold items that sometimes we don't have a choice depending on where we live. That, yeah. Um, Maybe it's got to come from the people. Yeah, look, and you'll have a look at the UN environmental program that, that just a couple of months ago there was a talk of a plastic treaty. The same way that we have the Paris Climate Accord, there's going to be a global plastic agreement. And they've said that the reason that that is getting to the point where they will legislate globally against certain, package, uh, certain plastics is that the community are just fed up they're fed up with the fact that we are drowning in plastic. Um, so yes, it happens. It happens slowly. Um, I think the argument, if I was to sit here and say, you know, on behalf of a big brand who produced a product, I'd say, well, customers are buying it. They want it. They, we produce it, they buy it. I agree when it comes to regional communities or remote. If you only have one product on the shelf, you actually don't have a choice which one it is. Um, and so we hear people talk about, you know, oh, you shouldn't, you only should choose it. If you don't have a choice, you don't have a choice. Um, but I would say to other communities that we buy it and actually we demand convenience, cosmetic perfection with our food. We don't want a broken biscuit or a squashed apple or we, we demand that the products look, you know, our foods look a certain way. So we've actually kind of created this rod for our own back a little bit as well. So it's incredibly complex. I'm sorry I can't solve that today. <laughs> uh, a question the terms biodegradable, compostable. I yeah. find them very misleading, especially yeah. because some plastic can break down a small piece yeah. and call it biodegradable. So, yeah, so please avoid degradable plastics. That's horrific. That is just like a really bad plastic that breaks into kind of shards of other plastic. Um, there's nothing environmentally friendly about degradable plastic. All plastic's degradable. Um, this is just stuff that breaks down very quickly with sunlight and water. Um, home compostable, there's an Australian standard for that. That is what you want to find. Most green bags like this, the corn flat cornstarch ones, are home compostable now. Um, most dog poo bags and that sort of stuff, um, and they really do break down in home compost. Home compost is a lot colder and less um, quick at breaking down um, stuff. So when they talk about compostable, um, like Biopack is a compostable packaging, it will only generally break down in really hot composting environments, which is a factory-based environment. So the problem with that sort of stuff and what you'll see in, on the 1st of November when they phase out um, some of the single-use plastics, they're actually phasing out compostable versions as well for some things. Because what it's happening is we're either putting it in here and it's not things don't break down like they do in compost and landfill. It's anaerobic. It's the wrong environment. Or we put it in here and it becomes a contaminant because we think it's plastic and we think it behaves like normal plastic, but it doesn't. So, so the, the foolish uses the uh, bamboo packaging now as well. I say that's compostable. So should you put it in red bin or compost it? I, if it's compostable and you have compost, compost it. I would encourage you to do that because it's great carbon generally. We have two questions here. I just noticed that there are some businesses that have an oversupply of plastics. And I'm thinking like hardware stores where everything is bubble wrapped and yep. plastic. And I'm thinking that there needs to be some sort of legislation or as community we need the feedback that if they want us to buy the product, they're going to have to go back to selling it singly. We don't need a hundred sometimes of screws and, and <laughs> other things. We, we only need a couple. Yeah, um, yeah so the, the talk, that sorry, I'll just repeat the question back. So the question is around um, multi-packs and also over-packaging of items like in hardware so that we can't 
just buy one screw, we have to buy 25 screws and they're all wrapped in packaging and we can't avoid it. And it's packaging that's questionable, isn't it? It's it, one of those it things. It could be coming in, in cardboard. Yep. A lot of the things, uh, yes, we can't see it, yep. but at least we could compost it. Yeah, 100%. And look, it's that issue of legislation, community demand and business industry drivers and it to be honest I don't think any of them happen alone I don't think legislation happens unless communities say we need this to happen industry doesn't respond unless they know that consumers are keen or, or, or would support a change they're often very worried of pushback because they get complaints I don't like the way the screws are packaged these days I like them when it was you get that a lot and you'll hear people so they have to it, and then also um, business lobbies government when they don't want a certain change. You know, the retailers were very clear that they only wanted to phase out single use when there was a very clear alternative, which, you know, they didn't want their cafes and hospitality to suffer. So it's not simple. And I, I, I agree that we need to make sure that we are vocal about the sorts of things we want, but also support business to find those solutions that work because, you know, they, they're the people who provide us jobs as well. Also growing growing as much as we can, supporting our local farmers, uh, you know, supporting this, the, the community based thing. Absolutely. If you local is great for everything. If you can get something local, exchange something local, grow something, there's absolutely huge benefits. Um, big support. You had a question as well? Yes. So I'm just wondering, considering it's so uh, difficult, you can make mistakes, it's confusing, what impact can really small actions like this actually have? Yeah, so the question is, what impact does small changes make when there's so many mistakes that you can make? Um, and that, you know, I guess the question is, is it really, does it really make a difference? Is that, is that the sentiment I'm getting? Yes. What do you guys think? Does it really make a difference what you do? Grassroots. And it starts grassroots and we are grassroots and we take it back to other people. And I've got another fellow Lions Club member here. Uh, and we're doing a grassroots battery collection situation which will be over all this area uh, starting about two months I'd say would be right and um, people will be able to go to various quite close things and put their things in there are lots of other battery collections use them all we don't care where you put them just don't put them in your garbage because they're so bad and the little ones babies and children and wild animals in the tip face eat these things as agonizing death even if they happen to get the battery out it's still bad so Lions Club are doing that, and I'm sure we'll go back and talk to other people, as we must all do. Mm. And I'm hearing that what you're saying is we need to protect the end user of this yellow thing, but when it gets there, they have to be able to do the right thing, otherwise we're overwhelming them with stuff that they can't handle. Yeah. And we're being so good, I'm putting every little thing in there, <laughs> and I'm driving them up the wall, and I yeah. thought I was being good. Now we can stop that. Yeah, and I look, I think my, quote, my response is that doing, and I've said this a few times before, um, with litter, for example, is that doing the right thing, i.e. picking up litter, is great. Like, it's lovely that people go and pick up litter. But the best thing we can do is not do the wrong thing. The best thing we can do is not litter. So it's great to be a really um, great recycler, but it's even better to just be not a rubbish recycler. <laughs> because if you're one of those people who are putting in, you know, half-dead moose and, you know, uh, nappies and rope and stuff, you are the ones that are undoing. The other stuff, you know, we've talked about the scale of what we're looking at here. There is a margin for error, and it's not always simple, and we're going to make mistakes. Like, no one is going to get it 100 and you're not going to get feedback. You're not going to know whether that rice cracker package that you put in on Tuesday ever made it to the plastic recycler. You're never going to know. But so it's a little bit of that, making sure that we are doing our very best um, and it's a, it's it's scales of magnitude. Like it, it's it's a hundred people doing the right thing versus a hundred people doing the worst thing. So in my it's like harm prevention. We just we're actually trying to prevent the really horrible outcomes, the fires, um, you know, the the injuries, um, the cost. So um, it doesn't have to be perfect all the time. Um, but if you follow those basic rules, you will be ninety nine percent there. One more question, and then I think I'm probably running well over time now. Not probably a question, it's more to a statement. statement. 
Did you want to say it in the microphone? Because is, is this a powerful moment we need to record? Yeah. <laughs> it was probably more against uh, a related to your statement of you. You know, you thought you were doing the right thing by putting all these little pieces in. My my advice would be don't stop that. Just keep like with like. So those little paper bread tags that are switched from plastic to paper, put them in your envelope. And you know things like that. Keep like with like. Those little pieces are still valuable. Just yeah, I, I get that they become difficult, but Reading. try to stop doing it. Thank you, Ange. Ange is our, um, our, our TRC, Tamworth Regional Council, waste educator. Is that uh, yeah, waste sustainability officer. Waste is that sustainability officer. So thank you. And once you've got a bit of that knowledge about size and shape and form, you can start to make decisions like that. You can say, well, if I put the metal lids within the metal can and close the can up so they don't get out, there's a fair chance it'll still get through. You know, so there are things you can do. I often don't cover that level because sometimes people start going, oh, not only did I know I was doing the wrong thing, but they gave me all these extra things I now have to do. Um, but, you know, there are some really great extra things you can do. Um, but, yeah, just go back and look at the sorts of things that you're routinely putting in there um, to make sure that it is, you know, and does your community ever do a tour of waste facilities? Is there anything like that that's ever... <coughs> yes, we do. We yeah. do tours of our Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. 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 We do go to community groups and talk to community groups. They just have to ask us to come because we don't know if you want us to come and talk to you. Um, but tours of our landfill facility, yes. The recycling facility here, not so much because we don't own it and operate it. And from a safety perspective, it's a bit difficult, but we do know how that works. So we are you know, always willing to talk to community too. And it's just a phone call. If you've got a question, bring it. I'm happy to talk to you. <laughs> so, um, or give you opportunities. Um, to know where to put things. It's, it, the information is there, but it's sometimes often hard to find too. And particularly if you're not into the technology side of things these days, a conversation is far more powerful. So please have it with us. Two questions. Um, one was just around going to our local tip and going to the landfill area, but seeing a whole lot of recyclables in that landfill and I don't know how that can get monitored or addressed or but that's, yeah and I didn't know what to do with that information but I see it all the time if I go to the tin in, in the landfill recyclables there. The other question was takeaway containers. You get takeaway food in. Where do they sit? <laughs> just like everything else, it's not simple because there's so many different types of takeaway containers. Um, if it's the Chinese food containers, which are really quite sturdy, then you can pop them in here. If it is, you'll see a lot more of the sugar cane or pulp, uh, paper based with like flexible plastic lids. And those lids, I question whether they're ever going to, they're kind of almost um, sort of uh, bendable, like they're quite yeah, it feels to me like quite a different plastic and I, again, it's to me, I, I'd be saying no, it's not going to make it through. Um, some of the worst offenders for waste is Japanese food, unfortunately, um, because you start to get these tiny little plastic trays which are weird colours and not ideal, they're not PT plastic, they're not going to eat so, and you'll get little sauce things which are very small. So. The best thing you can do with takeaway is, is have a conversation if you're a regular at that place and talk to them about what, you know, hey, what can I do to maybe avoid some of the packaging? Maybe they can give you some slightly less items in different ways so they don't have to give you all the sauces, whatever. Um, maybe they'll accept a takeaway container um, yourself if you're that passionate. It's very awkward for people with social anxiety. Um, but um, they are doing it first and foremost because they feel like they're providing the customer with a great product and service and by giving, sometimes they just need to know that that's not important to you. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of different packaging. Again, it's going to change 
Um, again, um, those takeaway, those Chinese food containers are not going to be phased out on the 1st of November, but um, there will be other containers that will be phased out. You won't be able to use clamshell polystyrene anymore. The fact that we still use that is very strange to me, but yes, that will be unable to be used. Um, yeah, but look, just ha again, you've got to go back to those rules. Is it scrunchable? Is it smaller than your fist? Um, does it hold its shape? Um, if in doubt, your guess is probably it will end up over there. So, yeah, it's frustrating, but um, it's it's one of the one of the big offenders when we come to excess waste. Um, I think I'm going to wrap it there just because I know some people have got to go. If anyone wants to stick around and ask any additional questions, by all means, you've got three um, people with varying um, local knowledge. <laughs> I say me. Not so much local knowledge, but um, yeah, happy to have a chat. Um, but thank you so much. It's been really um, fantastic to come and have such animated conversations about such seemingly boring stuff. Um, but you know, it's yeah, I think it's great that you all seem very committed to doing the right thing. And um, thank you, Karen, and thank you, the Tamworth Council, for supporting um, today. And, Recycle right. Thanks, Joe. I also want, also want to point out we have Sheridan here, oh. the manager of waste from Gunnada. So, oh, is there right. anything you wanted to add, Sheridan, that we haven't covered? Oh, no, just, she was nodding a lot, which is good. <laughs> But yes, yeah, sincerely thank you to you all for coming out. We appreciate your time. And um, I, I think to answer this lovely lady's question, I think if we could all just do that little bit extra and then talk to our friends, like Leah said, talk to our friends, talk to other people, encourage them, um, I think our little differences together will make a big difference. So um, thank you very much. And thank you, Joe. You're always amazing. I love to listen to you. Um, this is, was our first of four. We have a, another one with Joe. Um, at Narrabri in the morning and then Gleniness and Armadale on Friday. So a few friends, we haven't got as many there booked in. I don't know what happened to our extras today, but um, yeah, thank you. It's been a lovely um, day. Thank you.